Now, I'm going to introduce our international speaker and, and firstly I'd like to thank Roche Australia for, for uh, bringing this speaker out, particularly James Scott and Rachel Turner. Um, thank you very much for your support of this forum. Um, now, I get to choose who the international speaker is every year and, and we do have a consensus of who should talk and who shouldn't talk. This was an easy one for me, James. I met James um, at a conference uh, a couple of years ago and I've never come across a clinician who is more empathising with the patient and actually understands the patient journey as much as what James showed. So it was quite an easy choice for me to, to choose James to come out here. And also he's a big fan of Australian beer, which I think is a great, great asset to have. <laughs> So, um, as we've alluded to, James is, um, is at St Francis Medical Group in Connecticut, but James has also gave 22 years of his career to Duke University as well. And over that career, James has published over 130 publications. But I think the main setting where James has really made an impact is trying to develop new treatments for patients with relapsed tumours. And James has also done a huge amount of work looking at Avastin as well. So. Um, Thank you, James, for coming all this way, and the, the forum's yours. Well, I certainly appreciate the invitation. It's uh, my second time to Australia. I always have a good time. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why. I was trying to figure it out last night, but I think Australians and Americans have a real lot in common. Perhaps it's overcoming the British. Perhaps it's just a love of life and everything, but I seem to relate a lot better uh, than most of the other countries that I go to, so thank you. Um, when Curry asked me to, uh, to give this um, presentation, I said, you know, I know all the data. I know all the prognostic factors. Um, how about what it's like to be the physician caring for the patient? And I thought I would try to have some fun with what, how I get involved with the patient, what a privilege it is to, to care for the patient, uh, to care for the families. You know, brain tumors are devastating illnesses, and, and a neuro-oncologist really has to be uh, devoted to making the patient's life better. It's all about quality of life. Every single patient I see, I want to be like Deborah but I understand that 90% are not like Deborah, and I'm not gonna let down with my focus on their quality of life and what they need. Um, so I, I think that's gonna be my focus, and I hope to learn from you guys how I can do that better, because it's a privilege, but every day I think we can do better. So this was my topic, living with a, a brain tumor, a very challenging journey. Initially, for some reason, I liked the word sojourn, so I had that as a word, but sojourn, I had to look it up. It's a temporary visit. Well, this, there's nothing temporary about living with a brain tumor, so I had to change it to journey. Um, obviously, my English isn't too good, but... I don't think I put in that, <laughs> the boom. That must have been Dr. McDonald, because I'm not that uh, technically savvy. Um, so, you know, you go through life and you have certain events and um, you have relationships, you have uh, work, all sorts of things. Um, this particular um, explosion uh, really had a, a major impact on me and made me take a step back. So my daughter had graduated from college in, in the States and she loved philosophy. So she wanted to get her PhD in philosophy, um, but it's very highly competitive, much more competitive than medical school. Where she applied to, they had 5,000 applicants for each one that they took, and they usually take two a year. So she said, Dad, I'm going to Oxford. I said, you're going to Oxford? Why don't you apply for a Rhodes Scholarship? You know, she had done real well and everything, so she applied for a Rhodes Scholarship. She was one of the finalists, but didn't get it. And I was so proud of her, I felt so bad. But then I said, why don't you go anyway? She said, oh, I have already made that decision. I'm going, um, and you're going to pay for it. And I said, <laughs> oh, shucks. <laughs> you know? So she got to Oxford, was doing real well. Uh, about three months after she arrived, um, she was going to turn 22. Her best friend uh, was uh, working in Syria. So she said, I'm going to go visit her. I 
us, it's Syria. You know, being a protective parent, you don't want your kids ever to leave the house, you know. Um, so I said, why do you want to go to Syria? She said, Dad, I'll be fine. So, so she flew to Syria, had a great birthday, and then the volcano in Iceland. She got stuck in Syria for two weeks. My wife and I were going bonkers. You know, they were, the unrest was just starting. I said, Kate, don't leave your house, please, you know, or the apartment and everything. And I couldn't sleep. It was a hard time working. And what really impressed me was here was a relatively small event. She got back to Oxford fine. She only missed a week of classes, um, but she was able to make it up. But it was devastating to me. So I said, well, what do my patients go through? You know, I walked through the door. I said, I'm sorry, the tumor they took out is uh, glioblastoma. Their heart must just drop, because my heart dropped when she couldn't leave Syria. You know, and I said, boy, that was just an inconvenience. It was a thing for a kid. What about if it was me? You know, well, it wouldn't have bothered me to be in Syria, but it would bother me if someone walked through the door and said, oh, by the way, you have a glioblastoma. And one of the hardest things about glioblastomas is they affect all aspects of the person. I don't know whether how many people know Jim Valvano, who's a famous basketball coach and announcer in the United States. He formed the Jimmy V Foundation. And his famous speech, he was dying of uh, metastatic cancer, was the cancer can, is riddled throughout every bones. It can take away all my bodily functions, but it can't take away my mind, my spirit, or my heart. Glioblastomas do. They take away the person's ability to think, feel. All aspects of their life is turned upside down. So I think that's what we have to focus on. I try to individualize. Every patient I see, every family I see needs something very different. And that's really the challenge of being a neuro-oncologist. But I think that's why we're doing so much better, is because the neuro-oncologists have a unique ability to focus on the patient as a person. It's all about quality of life. It's all about palliative care, whatever that patient needs. So I thought I'd just go through a, a typical patient, what's involved with kind of their life turning upside down. I usually refer to it as a lightning bolt. You know, a person's perfectly healthy. They have a bad headache. They have a seizure. What do you mean I have a brain tumor? What do you mean it's malignant? What do you mean it's a glioblastoma? And then they look it up on, online, and oh my gosh, they enter a deep depression. So I think the diagnosis is one aspect that you just have to give them time. You have to support them through it. Um, most good brain tumor centers, I think the support staff is critical. I tend to focus on the medical aspects. I want to develop new innovative treatments, okay? But how that person reacts to my conversation with them is really the key. We, we have a wonderful neuropsychologist. We have a couple social workers, the nurses. It's, it's just a brain tumor floor. So they're very in tune with when to uh, seek the help of other allied health professionals. And I always tell patients what I do is about 20%. What the rest of the staff does is about 80%. So they finally hear their diagnosis. I try to explain a little bit. One of the biggest challenges I always have is how much does the patient want to know? How much of a disconnect? is there between the patient and the family. Family always wants to know prognosis. They want to know what the specific treatment options are because they're going to look it up online and they're going to find the curative treatment. The patient says, how can I live with this? I got to get up in the morning. You know, my kids are eight and 10. What am I going to tell them and things? So, so that's really the hard part, treatment options. There are a lot more treatments. Um, brain tumors are somewhat frustrating for an oncologist because we don't have as many treatments as a lot of the other malignancies. I think there's been uh, much less support um, for re research. Um, I've always found that a lot of the pharmaceutical companies are very hesitant to give us access to their promising molecules because they don't want a hemorrhage in the brain. They don't want a stroke. Brain tumor patients, well, they don't do well anyway. 
Um, if a person only has six months to live, why do I want to support a clinical trial of an innovative agent where other malignancies are much more likely to benefit? So that's something that I constantly try to educate them, that this is a high unmet need. You know, I try to invite them to the clinic, let them see my conversations with the patient, and it makes a huge difference. All of a sudden they say, okay, fine, we'll let you do a small trial. Why? Because you invoke the humanistic spirit. So treatment options. Um, I don't ever tell the patient what to do. Um, I have some patients that come in and say, I want hospice. And I say, what? You don't have any symptoms. We have good new treatments. They said either I heard about someone who suffered a lot and things like that. So that's where the whole educational process begin. And I don't think you can educate someone unless you have a good, strong relationship. It's one of the things I always respected about teachers is they, ha they really form a relationship with each and every kid if they're effective teachers. Um, as a neuro-oncologist, the relationship is the key. That's when I begin to form that, to uh, educate them, you know, about the science somewhat, about the uh, specific medicines, the treatment details, about the side effects, you know, but it's where both of us start to figure out how we're going to get through this journey together. Um, and there, fortunately, there's a few more treatment options that we have. I can't emphasize the uh, need for strong clinical trials. It's the only way we make progress. I'll give you a couple stories later on about where clinical trials really have made a very big difference in brain tumors patients' lives. Um, and the Australian Neuro-Oncology Network has a great group, um, and they do very well with clinical trials. They enroll a high percentage of patients, and, and that's really how we're going to make further progress. Um, pretty soon in my discussion with them about treatment options, um, the patient usually says, so can I return to work next week? And you go, what? Return to work? You know, you have six and a half weeks of radiation. Uh, you keep having seizures. Um, no, you can't return to work. And they go, well, I have to work. <laughs> you know, that's my life. That's what I enjoy doing. That's how I pay the bills. Um, so that's a whole nother conversation. And usually I get the social worker because I'm not trained in that. I don't have the, um, oh, either the insight or I, I'm not aware of some of the support systems, you know. So I, I very quickly recognize, oh, boy, this is a devastating discussion and, and I really do need help with that. Um, and then they start talking about the children and I go, oh God, here I'm devastated by my 20, she just turned 22, my 22 year old being stuck in Syria and worried about Al Qaeda and the radicals and things like that. Um, here's a person with a newly diagnosed brain tumor thinking of their kids. Um, I just want to see him graduate from high school. One of them's engaged, one of them's pregnant. I said, oh, brother, th this is tough stuff. That's when I get the neuropsychologist, <laughs> you know, to help with that stuff. Um, insurance, major implications. I know the healthcare systems are different, but the uh, financial burden that a brain tumor has on a patient can't be understated. Um, just devastating in, in terms of the, um, the amount of family resources that it takes to get through the treatment, um, to pay the bills, things like that. Um, and I don't think, I know our society doesn't do well with supporting patients. Uh, my patients didn't do anything to get their brain tumor. There's no known risk factors. Uh, children who got radiation for acute lymphoblastic leukemia to the brain, they have a higher incidence. But again, they didn't do anything to get their leukemia. Um, so that when you have so many impacts, I think our society needs to help those people. You know, the disability, giving them a third of what they normally make, it just doesn't work well. So I think we got to do better with that. Um, right from the beginning, the first day I meet the patient, I said it's all about quality of life. Um, I want you to stay positive, and if you focus every day on quality of life, then we'll have quantity of life, okay? I don't know what your prognosis is. That, that's the worst question I can ever get. How long am I going to live? Well, I know the data for 10,000 people. Um, I've been part of creating that data, but I'm looking at an individual human being. 
You know, they could have a seizure, they could have a hemorrhage and live a few days. They could be dead by patients 20 years out with a glioblastoma where every time they come in, one of the younger physicians says, that can't be a glioblastoma. And I look at him, I say, what are you talking about? It's a glioblastoma. The patient believed, we believed, and they were lucky. You know, there's nothing that was different about their treatment. Now, there's a whole lot of difference about that patient's tumor. And that's what I love about working at a place like Duke or what Dr. McDonald does. We're teasing out about the particular characteristics of the tumor, why those patients are long-term survivors, and hopefully our treatments will get a lot better. Unfortunately, as a neuro-oncologist, a lot of what I do is hospice care. And a lot of my colleagues won't do it. It's too emotionally burdensome. I say, gosh, I've been through this for two years with the patient and family. I'm not giving them up. You know, I want to make sure things go the right way so that patient doesn't suffer. Sure. No problem. Back to the patient, okay? The, um, so one of the keys early on is how is this tumor affecting the patient? If that tumor progresses, how do I think the tumor is going to affect the patient so I can intervene early on? I think one of the major advances in taking care of brain tumor patients is really focusing in on their rehab potential. Um, in the past, certainly when I was doing my training, people were put on high-dose corticosteroids, kept on high-dose corticosteroids until they died. And it was a huge mistake. A lot of them died of complications of the steroid weakness, depression, things like that. So I work very closely with the physical and the occupational therapist to make sure that those patients are getting the, the physical rehab that they need so they can function. Too many of our patients fall down. You know, well, it's preventable. You know, the patient says, I don't need a cane. Yes, you need a cane. You're not going to walk without the cane. You know, you enlist the family support to make sure things are done both in the home and so they can remain mobile. Uh, the cognitive dysfunction is a real tough one. I don't think we've done as well with cognitive rehab. It's a real big field and it's just starting, but I think there's the same potential to rehabilitate people cognitively um, so they're not so frustrated all the time. The speech therapists for people with aphasia do a wonderful job, you know. I can't quite say that word, write it down. Think of a different